an argument over toilet paper in their trolleys and ended up getting arrested as a result of that. There's even been a stabbing in the supermarket. And as we face these troubled times, we need to make sure that we are well armed and prepared to be able to face it as Christians and to show there is, in fact, a point of difference between us and the world and how we handle them. And as Paul writes to the Philippian church, he reminds us of certain truths that encourage us to ensure that we are equipped to handle these difficult times and enables us to navigate through them. I'm reminded of a story of uh, Lord Duvenin, who in 1915 wanted to send one of his employees across from America to England, and this was a highly valued employee. And because the, second, the First World War was on, and the Germans had threatened to sink any uh, ships going across the Atlantic, he was reluctant to send this employee across to Britain uh, to do some work for him. And so he said to the employee, look, I think it's better that you don't go. And this employee said, but sir, I've been preparing for this trip. I have been getting into a cold bath every day and preparing my body in case of the worst, in case the ship does happen to get torpedoed and go down. And I started off with five minutes in freezing water and each day I've built it up and until now I've managed to stay in a bath for two hours, so let me go. With reluctance, his boss allowed him to go across to <coughs> Great Britain, and he went in the Lusania, which you may or may not know, did in fact get torpedoed while he was on the boat. And he was rescued later, having been found in the water. He had been in the water for five hours, and they had found him well and uh, well prepared. And when they rescued him, it was because of his preparation that he was able to uh, survive those five hours of cold in the water until he was rescued. Paul gives us a way in which we can prepare and he gives us God's prescription for us in troubled times. And it's very helpful for us as we consider what the Apostle Paul says to us and how we can navigate through these times. The first thing I want you to notice in these words is the antidote to anxiety. The antidote to anxiety. If you look at verse 6, what does he tell us? He tells us this in verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. Let me just pause there because there's an important phrase there that he brings to our attention. Do not be anxious is in the imperative tense in the original. In other words, this is a command from Paul. He is saying to us, this is not an optional extra, but make sure that you do not get anxious. Now, the Philippians were experiencing troubled times like we are experiencing right now. So they were experiencing oppression as a result of their Christianity. They were expressing, expre uh, expecting economic difficulty. They were experiencing persecution, and some of them were experiencing poverty. When we look at the Christ, early and Christian church, many of them lived in very difficult circumstances economically and did not have the kind of means of income we did, neither did they have a system that would catch them if they were unemployed. They didn't have a welfare system like we do in Australia, and so there was tremendous difficulty for them in facing uh, those kinds of economic pressures that would inevitably come for those who lost employment. Now, I know that in the times that we face right now, there's no doubt going to be an, in an increase in unemployment. Qantas have already laid off 30,000 workers uh, until their bans are lifted in terms of their flying. That's going to affect them. They're encouraging they take long service leave. And some of them are going to be strapped financially. And I suspect in a congregation our size, some of you are going to experience tight times economically. It's going to affect your bottom line. It's going to affect your income. And Paul, in the midst of this, says to us, don't be anxious. This is a command. This is not just, well, just hopefully you'll survive these times and, and maybe just try and do the best that you can. But Paul is directing us not to be anxious. It is, in fact, the same words that Jesus brought to us when he spoke to us uh, and his disciples in Matthew chapter 6. Let me read the verses for you to remind you 
of Jesus' words to us as well. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food? And the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Do you hear that? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not one, of, uh, not, one not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus reminds us that God has got all of this under his control. And he reminds us that to worry is to not express our faith, our trust in God. Paul says to us, the remedy or the antidote to worrying is that we pray. Listen to what he says. I'm not putting words in his mouth. Verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, all-encompassing, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Now, what Paul means by those two words of prayer and petition, they're very similar, slightly different in nuance, but basically they mean take your specific request, those things that are, that are presently creating burdens upon your mind, take your general requests, bring them all together, and make sure that as you present those to God, as you give them over to Him, you do so with thankfulness being the overriding emotion that you bring your prayers to God with. So that we don't simply pray to God in a vacuum, but our prayer arises out of a thankful heart. Thankful for what, you may ask? Do you not understand, Ian, that we are going through difficult times? How can we be thankful? Well, God wants to remind us that our thankfulness is not bound up with present circumstances, but our thankfulness is bound up with the past of what God has done for us. So we are meant to look back over our lives. We are meant to see God's hands of provision. We are meant to focus on how God has watched over and looked after us. And then as we reflect on God's mercies, which he says in his word and lamentations are new every morning, we are then to allow that to dictate how we pray, when we bring our petitions, when we bring our burdens, when we bring our concerns to God. And that thankfulness is to permeate every part of our being, which is why the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4.4 4 is able to declare, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Or 1 Thessalonians 5.18, Give thanks in all circumstances, not some circumstances, not a few circumstances, but all circumstances. And these are reminders of us to ensure that as we bring our concerns, our depths of our heart cries to God in the midst of these circumstances we're in, we do so out of a heart that overflows with thanks. If you can't give thanks to God for your present circumstances, the least you can do is give thanks to God for your salvation, which is so rich and so free and grounded in the Lord Jesus Christ. I was ministering to a man in this church many years ago now who was dying in the palliative care in hospital and as he was dying in his bed, and I went to see him the day before he passed on, and he was lying in that bed heavily medicated, I began reading some scriptures to him. And then I turned to him and I said to him, John, how are you feeling about the fact that you're not going to be in this world much longer? And when he looked at me in the eyes, he said to me, Ian, with a beam, a smile on his face, 
a joy that radiated. He said, Ian, I can't wait to meet Jesus. In the midst of his pain, in the midst of the greatest trial that he was facing, uh, his impending death, he was able to take his eyes off himself, not allow what lay ahead and that reality of death to so cause him to become despaired and he was able to cast his eyes towards heaven and say I can't wait to meet Jesus in your circumstances as desperate as it seems as panicked as you might be as overwhelming as these these circumstances may present themselves can I encourage you don't be anxious God's got it in hand Trust in him, bring your anxieties to him, lay them at the foot of the cross. Jesus died to bear your anxieties upon him, to take away those anxious thoughts that so often cause us to be paralyzed by fear. Don't allow the circumstances around you to cause your anxiety to take root in your heart. Then I want you to notice that he gives us the anesthetic for anxiety. What is the anesthetic to anxiety? Verse 7, look what he says. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now that verse is rich in its meaning. Let me try and bring it out bit by bit. He begins, and the peace of God. What peace is he talking about? Because it's nuanced in terms of what he means. Well, there are two aspects to this peace that the Apostle Paul brings out. The first is the peace that comes as a result of the peace that God has brought between us and himself through the Lord Jesus Christ. So that once we were at war with God, once we were estranged from God, once we were enemies of God, now through the Lord Jesus Christ coming into the world, taking upon himself the wrath of God, fielding for us what we deserve, we now have been brought and reconciled to God. His wrath has been taken away from us who are in Christ and we are now at peace with God. That's the first meaning of of that word but there's an even deeper meaning than that and the other piece he talks about is the peace that exists within the Godhead God the Father God the Spirit God the Son are entirely totally at peace with one another so that the way in which they function is completely free of any anxiety there is never a moment within the Godhead that God the Father, God the Son, or God the Spirit is ever anxious about anything. They have absolute and complete peace. Now that peace, says the Apostle Paul, is the peace that God brings to you in this situation. It is an all-encompassing peace. It involves the entire being, so it's not just confined to our minds, but it's also involved in our emotions, our affections. It's involved in our heart. Every part of our being, that peace permeates. Now Paul tells us something about that peace. What does he tell us? He says, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding. Now, that's a rich phrase there. What the Apostle Paul means by that is that the peace which transcends all understanding is so great that it even goes beyond our ability to understand it. I know there are times where perhaps we may uh, experience something of God's peace that we do understand, but here is a peace that transcends the deepest troubles and trials that you and I might experience. And so deep is this peace that our minds, for all our intellectual abilities, cannot understand the depths and breadth of this peace. And it's that peace that God says that we cannot understand that in times of trauma and trouble comes to us from God and stills us in the very depths of our being. Notice what he says about that peace. 
And I want to read the second or the last part of that verse because I think it's very important. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will do what? Will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul uses a military term there, guard. It is a term that is used of soldiers whose task it is, whose responsibility it is to guard the garrison that they are in. When I did, as many of you know by now, as in fact probably all of you know, when I did national service, one of the things in South Africa, one of the things we had to do as soldiers is to guard the unit. And so every company would be assigned at a certain point in time uh, the guard duties of the entire unit we were in. And we were deployed all over that unit. And we were given two-hour shifts where we had to uh, guard whatever point we were in. Some of us, it meant walking around certain parts. Of, if you were guarding the ammunition dump, for example, we had to circle that and walk around it and make sure there were no external threats. If you were on the gate, you had to make sure that every single person that came into that unit had an ID that was verified. And we were told and instructed by our uh, platoon commanders that even if the colonel, the, the, the man who was in charge of the entire unit, even if he came to that gate, even though we knew who he was, we weren't allowed to let him in until he had given us his ID. And if he refused to give us his ID, in spite of the rank that he had, we were told not to let him in. And so there was the unit that was constantly being protected by the soldiers. That's the analogy that he uses. That God will set up a fortress around your heart and mind that he will guard you from the thoughts that so often can create panic in our minds and guard our hearts from being destroyed by our emotions that sometimes play havoc with the way in which we operate and cause some people to plummet into depression when difficulties come. God will guard against that. So you have in God a supernatural power coming from God to protect you against the difficulties that so often can so easily paralyze us. Isn't that encouraging? And it guards us from all different kinds of assaults. I want to share with you a story from Gideon's that uh, really helps us to understand what this looks like. Throughout their history, they've received many different letters from people uh, around. The one that came from the mid-century, uh, last century, was by, uh, came to be known as First Mate Bob. One winter morning, and I'm, I'm relating now his story from uh, Gideon's. One winter morning in San Diego, he says, after I'd wandered many miles along the waterfront in a daze, I turned my steps wearily towards my hotel room. I'd been drinking heavily for weeks. My mind was tortured by the thoughts of a wife and four children whom I'd deserted. Just yesterday, it seemed, I'd been on a radio executive in charge of two radio stations in Los Angeles. KFVD and KFAC, the home in which we lived in Beverly Hills, the cars, the servants, the things, the money and social position can provide for a man and his family were a distant memory. I dragged my family down with me until they were living in a little hovel and then I deserted them. I'd suffered a complete nervous breakdown and worst of all, I'd completely lost my voice. For a year and a half, I'd not been able to speak one word aloud. Each effort to talk was just a whisper. The future held no promise. I opened the door of my hotel room, flung myself into a chair in utter despair. My gaze fell upon um, a Bible, an old Gideon Bible that had been left on the floor. In a distracted sort of way, I picked it up and began to read. Old familiar words I'd learned as a child, words of life, quick and powerful, leapt out of those pages and found their way into my heart. I fell to my knees and spread the Bible upon the chair. 
And I made a vow that I would not leave that hotel room if I died of starvation until there came into my soul a knowledge that my sins had been forgiven, until I knew that I'd passed from death to life. With a surge of joy, I realized that God's promises were even for men like me. In that hotel room, I found Calvary's cross. There I laid my burden down. There the old man died. There a new one was born. From that place I walked in newness of life, a new creature in Christ, praise God. God straightened out things between my wife and me, and today she and I and our four children are back together again. That peace, he says, that peace that passes all understanding has loosened the taut nerves and muscles which prevented normal speech, and God gave me back my voice. In these times, when perhaps there's a run on the supermarket, when supplies are low, when your job perhaps may even come under threat, where unemployment may become a reality or lack or a, a reduced amount of employment, where perhaps even your ability to pay certain bills starts becoming an issue, can I encourage you? Look to God. Bring those requests to Him. Tell Him where your heart is at. Pour out your fears. Pour out your anxieties. Pour out the troubled heart that is overpowering you or threatening at least to overpower you. Allow God and his peace to so settle down within the depths of your soul that that peace ends up guarding your heart, guarding your mind. This is God's promise. And either we take God at his word or we don't. And so the challenge for us and for you and for me is to say, Lord, I don't know how this is going to work its way out. I don't know where it's going to end up. I don't know how long it's going to go for. But I'm going to lay it there at the foot of the cross and I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to put my faith in a God who has promised to guard my heart and mind with his peace. Will you do that? Will you put your palm and your hand in the hand of the master who calmed the sea? Thirdly, I want you to notice the prescription to anxiety, verses 8 and 9. Well now, if God gives us an antidote and if he gives us an anesthetic that helps us, what does he prescribe for us to do? If his peace guards us, if the antidote is to pray, what then are we to do? How then are we to respond? Well, God tells us. He doesn't just leave us in a vacuum. He says, this is now what you need to do in order that your mind doesn't continue to focus on those things that are bringing about the anxiety. Look at verses 8 and 9. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And that's where we're going to pause it this morning. But I want to take you to those, those thoughts um, that he gives us. Firstly, he says, instead of thinking about on all the things that can cause anxiety, what is this virus going to do? Am I going to get affected? Will I end up in hospital? Is it going to cause respiratory problems? Will I get enough toilet paper? Will I get enough groceries? What about the meat that's no longer on the shelves? Am I going to survive with this? What about my income? What about my children? What about my elderly parents? Are they going to be okay? All these things that can so permeate our minds and which we focus and the news that comes out and the restrictions that the government puts in. What about that holiday? trip I've had to cancel. Paul says, think on these things. What things does Paul tell us to think of? Well, come with me. He tells us. Whatever is true. What he means by that, it denotes all things that are true as God has revealed them in his word. God is truth. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth. Focus on what God has revealed in his word to be true. Allow those truths to permeate your mind. In other words, 
Go to the promises. Go to the things that remind you of God's care. Focus on the verses that remind us that God has got everything in his hand. Allow those truths to become the focus of your thoughts. God's word is important, in other words. God's word instructs us. God's word comforts us. God's word encourages us. And so in times of trouble, make the word, everything that's in it, one of your foci. Then he says, whatever is pure, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead, whatever is noble, what he means by that, whatever is honoring, whatever is worthy, whatever is holy, whatever is majestic, whatever is above reproach. In other words, in the Old Testament, it was the holy things of the temple. Think on those noble things. Don't allow your thoughts to go into the gutter. Allow your thoughts to think on all that is noble and dignified in uh, your mind. In terms of people, it points to what invokes reverence and dignity. Let those thoughts replace the anxious thoughts in your mind. Then he says, whatever is right, and that's an interesting word that he uses in. In, in the Roman society, it meant, it spoke about those citizens who were noble and who did and obeyed the law and lived in a right way in Rome. But it has more than that. It talks about justice as well. In other words, make sure that whatever your thoughts are, that you allow God's justice to permeate your thoughts. We've witnessed in our society at the moment. Unjust things happening, haven't we? We've seen people come to the supermarket and get pushed out of the way. We've seen some of the elderly not be able to get access to food because selfish people have taken more than they need. And in situations like that, God says, you must be different. Allow your thoughts to think about what is just and right in the society. Make sure, because if your mind is focused on them, then your actions will flow out of your mind and you will act in a way that is consistent with God's righteousness, with God's justice. And so it's important that we allow that to permeate. Then he says, whatever is pure, it means literally standing in awe of someone. Now, there is some overlap. Everything that is upright, it is a comprehensive term. In other words, in terms of your morality, don't let any impure thoughts come into your minds, but allow God's ethics, God's morals to dominate your mind. Allow that to cause you to act in ways that are consistent with God's morality. Don't act like the unbelievers. Don't allow your thoughts to think about what you can get for yourself to satisfy your own needs. Become other-centered and allow the purity of God's thoughts to permeate in your mind. Then he goes on, I need to keep moving. If anything is lovely, whatever is lovely, that's another interesting word. Anything that causes pleasure or delight God says, allow those thoughts to permeate your mind. It refers to the kind of person who makes themselves attractive to others. In other words, it's not just about thought processes, but those thought processes working their way out into your character so that it's the kind of person that is attractive to others. We had a lady like that. We have some in this church, but I don't want to embarrass anyone. We had a lady like that in the previous church that I pastored who just had such an inner disposition that permeated this loveliness that Paul speaks about, that she had an attractive personality to her. That's what he's talking about. You as a Christian, when you're out there in the market, when people are fighting, you show something different. You show that you're not bound up with those kinds of self-centered motivations and expressions of character. Everything that is lovely, admirable, then he says. Think on everything that is admirable. Um, now that means anything that is well-sounding, praiseworthy, attractive, and appealing. It means uh, the kind of thing that is likely to win others over, 
to win others to Christ, that which seeks to avoid offending others. So, so the Apostle Paul is saying now, make sure that the way in which you behave doesn't cause offense to others, doesn't put them offside, doesn't cause them to, to uh, take it out uh, and, and cause them to look upon you in a disdainful way and then sully the character of Christ. So don't get involved in arguments in the supermarket. If you reach out and someone bustles you and pushes you out the way and takes that last thing of toilet paper or tuna tin or rice or flour, don't get upset about it. Don't get angry about it. Don't overreact. Just smile politely and move on. It is that which causes least offense. And then he says... um, Whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, anything that uh, is excellent in God's sight, anything that brings praise to God, anything that focuses on His excellencies, allow those things to permeate your mind. Now, why is Paul so concerned that we focus our minds on these kinds of characteristics? Well, for the simple reason that what our mind thinks about is what ends up being expressions of our behavior. If our minds are focusing on those things that are right, then our behavior will conform necessarily to those things. And that's why it becomes so important that we focus on the right things. We want, as Christians, to show the world there is another way. We want to show the world that we don't act like those who fight over things and fight to get get things. And we want to show the world that in times of pressure and trouble, when we are under pressure as they are, we show exemplary qualities that are consistent with the character of Christ. And as these things overflow into our minds, our hearts, and into our behavior, so we will continue to trust the Lord Jesus Christ and allow him to be the one who causes our soul to be at rest that God's peace might permeate our minds and our souls. So can I encourage you, in this time of panic, you don't have to panic. God has given you an alternative path to follow and can I encourage you to follow that path and to allow yourself to rest in Him because He alone brings a peace and a comfort to the soul that passes even our human understanding that will guard our hearts through this troubled time. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for your word that instructs us in troubled times, that you give us a prescription for the soul, and we ask, O God, that in this time of uncertainty, in this time where anxiety is rife, that as your people we would stand out, that we would be different, that we would trust you, that we would lay our anxieties at the foot of the cross, and that the Lord Jesus Christ might permeate every pore of our being, that we might be an example of who Christ is and what he has done. For Jesus' sake, I pray. Amen.